Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is yeah. other than to say you're in really good hands. That Mike is the director. Help me, Mike. I don't know the full title yet. Director of legislative oper legislative. Help me. Director of legislative operations, Ron. Thank and you. And I'll I'll do my best not to let the room burn down next week. Okay. And that's a new title for you, right, Mike? Uh, that's correct. Um, Act 144 passed uh, in late June, separated the operations unit out of Pledge Council. Okay. So the committee assistance and the administrative part of the legislature is now in legislative operations. Great. No, that's some, something we'll get used to. Um, so if we refer to you as the in, from the wrong division, please don't take it personally. Um, and when we get our next legislative Facebook next year, I'm sure we will. Um, well, so director of legislative operations, is that, is that what you're saying? So DLOPS, is, is that what you're doing? Is that how you call it down in the office is uh, with an acronym? Yes, um, when we're in the office, that's what we do, our jobs. Yes. Okay. Um, all right, well, welcome everybody. It's Friday morning and uh, September 4th. And we are about to begin another session for General Housing and Military Affairs. Uh, we have two bills that we're considering this morning. One is S-187, uh, which has been sitting in human services and was um, given to us this week. It is about, um, uh, very vaguely, it is about um, providing an exemption to landlord-tenant law for certain facilities for certain care facilities. Um, we have several witnesses to testify about that today. We have Chris Donnelly from, from Champlain Housing Trust, Jason Williams, and Claudio Fort is here, was here, um, from Rutland, and so uh, in support of this bill. So um, without, and then we'll get to S-237 after that, and we have um, Jacob Hemrick, and we'll have, I believe, we'll have Commissioner walk with us at some point um, to discuss it further uh, facets of that bill. So um, uh, who would like to start from from either Jason or Chris? Chris, do you want to do your usual teeing it up and then pass it to Jason? I'd be, be happy to. All right. So please, Chris, join us. The microphone is yours. Okay, thank you. Good, good morning. Um, again, for the records, Chris Donnelly with the Champlain Housing Trust. It's good to see you all again. Um, um, although I'm sorry that you're back in September. Um, um, and I just before I get into this, I just wanted to thank you for all the work that you've done. Um, the uh, coronavirus relief funds that you helped allocate uh, in June are already being put to use. We actually heard last night that we have approval to create 68 new apartments in Essex that are going to house people who've been experiencing homelessness. And that's directly due to the heavy lifts that, that you guys um, all took advantage of in the, in the um, uh, extended session in June. Um, I also spoke with uh, one of our residents yesterday who hadn't been able to pay her rent for months and has um, now uh, been um, uh, given a grant through the Vermont State Housing Finance Agency. That's also money that you helped um, move along. And she takes care of her granddaughter who is starting up at school. And she is just so thankful not to have to move and to have that kind of security. So I just wanted to uh, start out by saying thank you for all the efforts that you made. This bill, um, uh, S-187, should be a much simpler um, approach than, uh, than many of the things that you have been working on. The aim of the bill is just to avoid unnecessary and adverse health outcomes from vulnerable Vermonters by exempting them from our landlord tenant laws when they are in a short-term stay at a motel and when they're being paid for by a medical center or a hospital medical center or designated agency. Um, it's a small exemption in um, landlord tenant law that just gets at some of the most vulnerable people that are being um, uh, put up in uh, motels when there's no place for the hospital to safely discharge them. This came about um, 
uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Harbor Place, but Harbor Place is a motel that Champlain Housing Trust owns and runs in, uh, in Shelburne. Um, that is a more structured approach to the motel voucher program. Uh, we bought this motel about seven years ago. Um, soon after, uh, in a, we have a contract with the state to put people up when the shelters are full or there's no other safe place to be. Um, uh, soon after we opened the hospital and uh, medical center here in, in Burlington approached us and said, you know, we have lots of people in our hospital beds that we've been discharging to motels or we can't discharge because there's, we can't discharge them to a tent. Can we um, build a relationship with you? And we said, sure, we're happy to, happy to do that. The, the um, benefits in Harbor Place is that there are services right on site to support people. So it's a much better place to be uh, than, and then you just scattered in, in motels around. Um, the, um, the, the trick with Harbor Place uh, that we soon found out was that because of the market in Chittenden County, people were staying longer than 28 days. And at 28 days, you trigger landlord tenant law. And so uh, people could be establishing tenancy after 28 days. Two or three years ago, the state the legislature um, approved an exemption in the current statute that um, says that if you are being paid for through the general assistance program, which 30 of our people every night are, if you're being paid for by, uh, through the state program, then you do not establish tenancy. And so that clean, cleaned up part of, um, part of the challenges where we were having to move people out um, uh, after 28 days for a day and then move people back in. So really disruptive for people's, for people's lives. Um, and at times we would lose track of where people were and then they would, um, they would fall into a more difficult situations. So this really was a, a kind of a, a, a safety net for, for people to not have to move them out and disrupt their lives. That change in the law did not include uh, people that were at Harbor Place or at other, um, any other hotel that were there because of a uh, medical reason, because they were being paid, uh, if they were being paid for by the hospital. And so this bill essentially just adds um, those people, uh, the small number of, of uh, people, and Jason can get more into the details, the small number of people that are being placed in motels because they don't need a hospital bed and uh, but they do need a safe place to be instead of a tent or a um, substandard housing so it adds that exemption into the law so that people aren't establishing tenancy and we don't need to uh, remove people after after uh, 28 days um, uh, already in statute um, hospitals and nursing homes are exempt uh, i mentioned the ga program where people are being paid for uh, through the ga program or if you are in a, um, staying at a campground, you're exempt. Uh, so this just adds another, um, another pretty safe, um, uh, pretty simple um, addition to that, that statute. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and happy to answer questions, um, but it's a, it's a I think it's a pretty straightforward, um, uh, pretty straightforward bill. Oh, the one thing I will add, um, just um, since I saw this this morning, there may need to be a, just a quick technical change to the bill that if the, um, um, the enactment date is July 1, 2020, which has already passed. So we'll need to, that will need to be updated. Okay. Yeah, we just had a bill that was a concurrence with further amendment because of that date. Um, in another on another bill, um, we have two questions right now: Representative um, Representative Kalaki, and then Walls. Thank you, Chris. Um, is this unique only to Harbor Place? Or are there other situations around the state that this will also apply in East of Burden? Um, I, um, I I don't think it's you do is not unique to Harbor Place. I think there are probably other medical centers that are putting people up in motels. Harbor Place is a one of a kind um, uh, facility, but I do believe I've heard that a similar type of facility is, is starting up in Rutland and you'll have um, someone from the Rutland Regional Medical Center here. Uh, okay. talk about that. Thank you. Okay, Representative Walls. 
Thank you. Uh, Representative Kalaki just asked one of my two questions uh, because we have had people in Barry being placed in motels and I didn't know if any of them were for medical reasons. So, okay, we don't know the answer to that. My second question, uh, people being placed for medical reasons, is the funding different? And does that create a problem or is that an issue we need to address in the bill? It, it should not be an issue that you need to address in the bill. The funding is different. It's coming straight from the uh, the medical center or a designated agency to pay for those those rooms. Um, I'm sure. Um, um, well, I, it's. Um, I, I'm sure Jason can can answer that in a little bit more detail. But uh, they have a charge to not discharge people into unsafe places. And therefore, they use their resources, whatever pot of money it comes from, to uh, to pay for these rooms. We have a discounted rate uh, for all of the people that we work with at our place. We charge forty-two to forty-five dollars a night for a single room, so it's, it's a little cheaper. But they also get services, right? Which is part of what makes Harbor Place unique and. Um, so that's, I mean, in 42 to $45 a night is roughly almost half the price of, or just over half the price of a motel room without services and certainly is far cheaper than a hospital room. Um, all right, any questions for Chris right now? Chris, obviously you're please. I know you wanted to also um, be present for the conversation on S-237 if we have time. Um, so I'm going to pop over to Katie McClinn because the bill is so short. Um, I'd just like to have her do the walkthrough. And, um, and so Katie, please go ahead. Sure, let me pull up the document. Well, that's the underlying statute. Let me switch over. Here we go. Um, so good morning, Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Counsel. And we're looking at S-187 this morning. And you'll see that we're, we're working in um, Title IX, Section 4, uh, 4452, which is within the chapter on residential rental agreements. And so we're looking at exclusions. And this um, particular statute has a whole list of exclusions that are in current law. And basically um, all of the items in this list are excluded from residential rental agreement law. And so um, Mr. Donnelly referenced the occupancy for um, recipients receiving general assistance and emergency assistance. That's an existing lot subdivision eight. And what this bill does is add a similar carve out or exception at subdivision 10. And that reads that transient occupancy by an occupant placed in a hotel, motel, or lodgings in connection with healthcare treatment or recovery, where the occupancy is paid for either by a hospital, DA, a designated agency, or a specialized service agency, regardless of whether the occupant is subject to the meals and rooms tax. And that language tracks the language in subdivision eight. So that's the whole carve out. Um, and then as was noted previously, if you decide to move forward with this, we'll have to update the effective date. And that is the whole bill. Okay, and so um, just in terms of, just in terms of um, research, if we want to, um, obviously we can go directly to the underlying step statute, which you had posted there for a split second to have mm -hmm. all of the exemptions, just for if we were interested in, in that. But this is, um, I don't know, this is fairly clear now that we know that the context, what the context of it is. Does anybody have a, um, Representative Hangel, you have your hand up. Thank you. I just wanted to ask another clarifying question. I think it's been answered, um, but this did come up in one of my communities because we do have a motel that is being used to house folks. Um, 
even though the GA program or motel voucher program is technically paying the motel owner, the money for that is coming from Medicaid or a designated agency. Is that correct? Because this person might have a medical condition. I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer that question. Yeah, I I'm, guess I'm sorry. I wasn't meaning to address that to you, Katie. Anybody who wants to jump in and answer that, Chris, maybe. Um, most of the people that are that come through the, the GA program are being paid for by uh, the DCF. And is there reimbursement from Medicaid if they're um, being housed because of a medical issue? I, I'm not sure of that. Maybe Jason or Claudio have the answer to that, but I, I, I'm not sure about that. I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. Yeah, and I think that there's a, I think, well, let's let Jason and, and, and Claudio maybe address that before. Um, so uh, without further questions for Katie, um, uh, let's move to Jason and then Claudio. Thank you, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, I'm Jason Williams. I'm the Network Director for Government and Community Relations for the University of Vermont Health Network. And uh, I was involved 13 years ago when uh, Champlain Housing Trust through a really collaborative uh, inclusive process stood up Harbor Place. Prior to Harbor Place, uh, some of you may remember the GA motel voucher rules were very different. And many of the patients who we saw, uh, uh, and this is most acutely at UVM Medical Center, um, just from a sheer numbers perspective, um, as you can uh, imagine, but many of the patients that we saw who were experiencing homelessness before a health um, incident, before they needed healthcare services, uh, qualified for those uh, emergency motel vouchers. When uh, DCF changed the rules on those vouchers, uh, we suddenly found ourselves uh, with many uh, highly vulnerable individuals who no longer qualified for uh, an emergency motel voucher. Um, uh, almost all of the patients we uh, typically were discharging were not going to qualify. And so we were uh, facing a situation with an unknown number of uh, patients who had been experiencing homelessness with no safe uh, discharge plan. As Chris said, we are uh, bound by law to ensure safe discharges for every patient, um, whether they uh, are safely housed or not. And uh, sending somebody who is um, highly medically vulnerable back to where they came from, which could have been a tent or from a shelter, if that is no longer safe uh, because of their medical condition, because of their treatment, then we cannot discharge them. And so we had a pretty significant backup in the hospital. Uh, and then we started going out, as Chris said, to motels um, simply to find a safe place for people to be able to go and to recuperate. Uh, when we picked up the phone, those charges were um, two and sometimes even three times what um, the, uh, the Harbor Place alternative ended up being. And as Chris said, and as um, you said, Mr. Chair, those, uh, those placements didn't come with any services. There was no case management. There was no access to services to ensure that somebody is able to, to go on to a permanent housing solution. So when we started this, we found ourselves um, uncertain of uh, uh, exactly what the right patient characteristic, what the right patient profile would be to send to our place. This was brand new territory for us. And so we were sending patients who were very close to being back at their pre-medical incident, pre-healthcare um, intervention baseline. And so originally the stays at Harbor Place were, were relatively short, um, uh, averaging less than a week um, for the patients we were discharging and paying for to go to Harbor Place. 
This gets to um, what I think is an important question, which is why why now? You know, we're seven years into this. Why are we now thinking that this is an issue? We have the services that are being brought to bear are are more mature. Uh, they are better resourced than they were seven years ago, and we know how to put people there and have them be successful in that setting. Um, and so we are now, for instance, sending patients there who are actively receiving healthcare services, not just who need a discharge from the hospital. So somebody who might need um, a lengthy period of infusions, somebody who is um, going to be prepping for a surgery or a procedure. Um, uh, we've really expanded our thinking about the types of uh, patients or anticipated patients who benefit from Harbor Place. And so what we've seen is um, a really remarkable increase um, in the average length of stay for people that were sent to Harbor Place. This is also coupled by what Chris said, and that's a, a very challenged market for pe getting people permanently housed. Um, the barriers are seemingly endless. Um, so we are at a place now where about 60%, between 50 and 60% of the patients that were paying to stay at Harbor Place are staying there for more than 28 days. And these are exceptionally vulnerable individuals, people with uh, past trauma experiences, people with multiple chronic illnesses, significant mobility challenges, people who may have been in a homeless uh, service organization in a shelter setting, uh, and uh, their illness makes it so that they are no longer, or that is not a tenable situation for them anymore. And so we can't discharge them back to a shelter. Uh, and so we are seeing um, uh, very ill, very vulnerable people and sending them to Harbor Place where they're receiving exceptionally good service. Uh, and, uh, and so that length of stay has increased. And that means that on that 28th day, these folks are being packed up and moved um, to avoid tripping the tenancy requirements. Uh, and uh, that is uh, not the service they need. That's not the experience they need to be well. Quite frankly, it feels rather inhumane. And so that is why now, that is why we think that this change needs to happen. As for the payment piece of this, the first year that we were partnered with Champlain Housing Trust and others at Harbor Place, we uh, used um, a small pot of some uh, uh, in investment funds that the hospital has to invest in social service organizations. As a bridge, um, I made a, a promise with the then manager of case management and social work that this could not be a program where we are depending on those one-time sort of philanthropic investment dollars to make it work. Uh, and so he, um, we agreed that if we could get this off the ground, he would turn that into an operational expense out of his budget. And so these funds are coming out of the case management social work um, budget, which gets used for any number of other things related to supporting our patients from transportation to food to clothes to um, any number of other things that a, a person may need. Um, and that expense has significantly increased over time um, as we have increased the number of patients who, who are successful in a setting like the Copper Place. The vouchers for people, my understanding um, to your uh, question, Representative Hango, uh, the, the vouchers are paid out of the DCF budget. Medicaid will reimburse for whatever care the patient may receive, and they may receive care in Harbor Place. I know that UVM Health Network, Home Health and Hospice regularly sees patients there, um, but my understanding is that they do not reimburse for the housing component. That's actually a pretty significant uh, red line uh, when it comes to uh, federal rules around um, Medicaid expenses. They really don't pay for housing. As, as uh, many times as we have tried to finagle it, it just won't work um, there. But they'll pay for housing in a hospital. Yes. And the cost differential, the, the cost differential is how significant the difference between $45 a night and a hospital stay. So the, the cost of a hospital, it's significant. Or, or we're talking exponential orders of magnitude is the difference. I, I will also just take a moment to plug uh, that most of the patients that we see here, um, uh, are, there's actually a very high percentage who are Medicare covered patients. Um, 
there are a good percentage who are Medicaid covered, very few in the single digits from a percentage perspective who are commercially insured. And so for, a, for the hospital, um, we are um, reimbursed below the cost of care for over 90% of the patients that we discharge to Harbor Place. Um, and so by being able to use Harbor Place, um, we are able to, uh, uh, as I like to say, lose less um, by getting people into that more appropriate, more cost-effective setting. And losses by the hospital system were paid by us all. Correct. Yeah. Representative Hango, then Kalaki. Thank you. I think most of my questions were answered, especially um, um, by the observation from the chair that if a person prior to Harbor Place is being housed in a hospital for medical reasons and cannot be discharged, then um, the hospital is reimbursed by Medicaid or Medicare for those, um, those expenses for housing. And I do understand that that is a great operating loss for hospitals. Um, so taking that a step further, when the person leaves and goes somewhere like Harbor Place, then the state picks up the tab for that person's housing, which essentially is quite a bit less, um, but it still does come out of all of our pockets. Is that a correct? For many of the people that we're sending to Harbor Place, we, the hospital, we, UVM Medical Center, are actually paying. So, Very few of the patients we're discharging are qualifying for the state's motel vouchers. Okay, so then, therefore, we're still paying <laughs> um, when, we, right. when we, who have commercial insurance, go to the hospital and need a procedure or a stay. This okay. is reducing those cost increases, that's right. Yep. Thank you very much. That was a great explanation. Representative Kalaki. Jason, is Rutland now doing this as well? Do you know, Chris mentioned that John and Rutland are looking at doing this. We have, we have Claudia so, with us. Yeah. <laughs> we have, our next witness is gonna. Oh, okay, sorry. Yes. Uh, okay, can you uh, explain to me right now, um, what happens on the 29th day at Harbor Place and what this will change? I actually think that this is a better question for Chris. Okay. To, to explicitly put him on the spot. <laughs> um, we, are, we need to move them to a different motel. They need to move out and then they come back. Okay. And when you say they have to move out, they have to pack up all their stuff. They have to actually, you can't, it, my my memory is that you can't have a storage shed for them to have put their stuff in, which is disruptive unto itself um, for a day or two. Like they have to move out. Is that is that your is that what happens? Uh, that's that's what's supposed to happen. Yeah. And who? Sometimes we who pays? Sometimes we try to make things a little easier for people. Okay. Yes. I, but, no, I understand. Um, but and how is that paid for? Like on day twenty nine. When you, when Champlain Housing Trust has to move them out of Harbor Place to somewhere else. That would be the medical center. Medical, the center. medical center continues or to Or designated pay. agency. Okay. Thank you. I understand. All right. Um, Representative Gonzalez. So just as a follow-up um, for that, of if, they're ha if somebody is having in the middle of care, which is why they're there, then they have a, uh, that care interrupted as well, that they're not able to access the services that they weren't ac accessing in Harbor Place. Um, is, is that a correct understanding? So if they're receiving care at the hospital that were, for instance, bringing them back to forth in a taxi to receive or, or an SSTA, then they will still receive that. If they're receiving um, home-based care from UVM Health Network, Home Health and Hospice, they'll re still receive that. The interruption is in that on-site case management. Um, and those on-site services that cannot be effectively provided in a scattered manner. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Toronto. Thank you. Um, so how long do they have to move out for? Is this a, 
a matter where they step out for one day and back in, or do they have to stay out for a certain amount of time? I mean, I, I understand the packing up and leaving is, is pretty crazy also. Um, uh, what is the situation on that? Chris? It's be out for a day. One day. Yeah, it's, it's can, pretty inhumane as, as Jason. I mean, there's just, there's no real reason for yeah. this to happen yeah. at all. And it's just, it's treating reset vulnerable, a clock vulnerable, vulnerable citizens as as um you know as as some kind of commodity you know it's just it's a uh, it's just bizarre and and to reclarify before we move on to claudio just to reclarify the this narrow exemption is not for i mean there's already an exemption for people receiving ga um but this is this is um uh something that's just limping I, I don't know if it's fulfilling the circle but it's also it's this isn't for some people who well i guess if people are being paid for by ga generally speaking that's your primary population i'm just trying to you know just trying to like figure out that this is this is a narrow exemption for people who are coming to harbor place or in rutland or some other facility that may be created that's being paid for by a hospital um for their care. I just want to make sure that we're, you know, that this isn't very, this isn't broad and opening it up to, you know, some slippery slope on the landlord tenant law. This is an exemption that fits in with stuff that already exists, nursing homes, hospitals, et cetera. And I mean, am, am I seeing it that simply? At Harbor Place, by, to annualize our pre COVID time, um, I would expect if we were to annualize that for the current year that we're in, you'd be able to count the number of people on your hands and feet, um, on your fingers and toes. It's really 20 to 50 maybe who would be impacted here. Okay. And Chris, is Harbor Place still being operated as, a, as an emergency center or is it back to normal business? Uh, Harbor Place is the state's um, isolation and, re and recovery a uh, quarantine facility for people that have no other place to be isolated or quarantined from COVID. Okay. And the success is that we have between one and three people there a night. It's, it's underutilized, but that's the success that we've had um, in Vermont. Great, thank you. Um, all right, with that, I wanna move over to Claudio Fort from Rutland. Um, Claudio, if you can, um, this I believe is your first visit to our committee and appreciate you becoming available for, for this conversation because I think it is important to see that this is uh, gonna be a need that's growing across the state. And so having um, Rutland pick this up is, is really important. Um, so if you could just introduce yourself, tell us, who you are, what you're doing, and and um, and what you're working on, that would be great. Great, can you hear me? Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairperson and members of the committee. Uh, I am Claudio Fort. I'm the president and CEO of Rutland Regional Medical Center, and I appreciate you allowing me the opportunity to speak to you this morning uh, about our support of S187. Um, here in Rutland, in our most recent uh, community health needs assessment, uh, Rutland Regional identified housing issues as one of the top four health needs in our community. Um, and because of this, uh, we have been very excited and uh, been partnering in, in support of a new transitional housing project that's being developed by the Rutland Housing Authority. Uh, this project is modeled after the successful Harbor, Harbor Place uh, project in Burlington that you've just heard about and you're probably very familiar with, um, that's run by the Champlain Housing Trust. Uh, our, the Rutland project, um, our relationship, uh, similar to the relationship of University of Vermont Medical Center uh, has with Harbor Place, Rutland Regional Medical Center will enter into an agreement with the Rutland Housing Authority uh, to secure access to some of the housing units to support patients being discharged from our hospital. Like Harbor Place, uh, the Rutland Project will have wraparound support services uh, being provided through the Homeless Prevention Center, the Rutland Mental Health Designated Agency, 
and our hospital to help these clients uh, transition to permanent housing. Um, so this bill, S-187, for the reasons you just heard uh, earlier, um, will help us support our patients' recovery uh, who might require more than 30 days in this setting. Um, so we don't have any experience yet. The project is being fast-tracked. Uh, the Rutland Housing Authority was able to access some coronavirus relief funding to make this happen. Um, and uh, we anticipate that our, uh, the Rutland project will be complete and built out mid-December and ready for occupancy by the end of the month, end of December. So, um, so for the same reasons that you heard uh, from, the rep, uh, from Jason and uh, um, others this morning, we respectfully request your support of this uh, bill. So thank you for your consideration and I'm happy to answer uh, any other questions you might have. Um, just to repeat, so the project that you're working on is CRF, is, a, is that a, I'm sorry, is that a CRF fund? Uh, yes, for the, uh, for the development of it, they're accessing yeah. some CRF funds. Right, and, and so then you're able to get it done by, as you just said, you're, you're going to be able to get it done by, by the deadline. Uh, I, Kevin Loso from the Rutland Housing Authority yeah. would have been here this morning, but he is actively, uh, he's been um, really focused on, he's, you know, they're in the final um, permitting stages, so, and, and finalizing their financing, so he's really scrambling. So um, you, you got the B team of me instead um, this morning. But yes, that's, that is the plan. And similar to what, um, again, similar to what UVM is doing, this pro our project is modeled on the Harbor Place project. So for those same reasons you heard from Jason uh, earlier, um, Rutland Regional, it will be um, uh, providing financial support. We're providing some capital support uh, for them for upfront for the build out. And then we will have an ongoing service agreement where we will secure two units um, for use for hospital uh, patients being discharged. That's great. Um, no, that's great. Representative Gonzalez? Uh, you may have said this and I missed it, but what's your anticipated population for this building? Uh, there are uh, uh, planned to 12 units in this building. Um, and I think uh, two of them are gonna be for families. Um, and some of like our unit, we are, we are going to have uh, reserved for the hospital two um, single bedroom units, but there's going to be a um, kind of like in the hotel type situation where there's going to be a door in between that you can lock from either end. So you could open that up if you did have a, a larger uh, family unit that mm -hmm. needed that. Great. Thank you. No, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, we're able to uh, to see the Harbor Place model um, grow, and um, and and really people making decisions to grow it based on you know the data that that Harbor Place has been able to show over the years. So um, congratulations for getting that going, and thank you for getting that going. Well, thank you. No, uh, the, really, the credit goes to we, we're playing a small part in this. Really, credit credit goes to Kevin Loso, the Rutland Housing Authority, and. Homeless Prevention Center and others who uh, uh, really made this happen. The, the one other thing that I would add that you might not have heard earlier, um, not only is it a financial issue for the hospital when we have um, people who don't need hospital care uh, are residing here at the hospital, um, it's also a space uh, issue. Um, here at Rutland, we are um, back to pre-COVID levels for inpatient care. And those patients seem to be uh, anecdotally sicker than they were uh, pre-COVID. Um, so, you know, we have 30 medical beds uh, uh, on our floor. We can flex up to 35, which we usually do starting in the winter. But after that, there's no room at, at the end. So, you know, that causes a lot of challenge and disruption when, um, you know, when we just don't have room for another medical patient because there's someone who... who uh, and actually, it's, you know, the hospital is not a good place to live and to spend, you know, weeks or months of time. It does not help your 
your ongoing recovery and um, so forth. So, you know, there's a big financial impact, but there is also a um, recovery and, and impact on the patients that are being affected. All right. Any further questions for our witnesses before we turn on um, the conversation amongst ourselves? All right, so thank you, Claudio and Jason and Chris. Please um, feel free to hang out. So so committee, as I mentioned, as we started, um, this is, this is um, I think I'll first say, please bear with the fact that this is an end of biennium situation where we don't have six weeks to consider this bill um, under normal circumstances. But I do think the, the reason I asked for it was because I do think that it's, um, it's pretty narrow and pretty simple and fits into all of the work that we've been doing to, to try to mitigate homelessness um, and, and provide some care to the, to the most vulnerable. So I would just put it out on the floor um, and just ask, what are our thoughts? Just um, any comments, any thoughts, Representative Byron and then Walsh? No, I mean, uh, on the first run through, um, it, I, I see absolutely no problem with this. It's a very focused exemption that I think is very logical, especially as we're dealing with a COVID world. I don't think it makes sense how it's operating right now, where we're uh, kind of needlessly moving people around um, in shelter situations. Uh, so on this first run through, I, I completely support this. Okay, Tommy and then um, Chip. And then I think Mary's trying to press her. Mary, are you trying to get your hand up? up? There you go. Okay, well, I agree completely, We're represented by wrong, so I, uh, I guess I can only second what he said. This seems to make a lot of sense, especially uh, during our COVID emergency, so I fully support it as well. Great. Um, Representative Triano, then Howard. Thank you. Um, yeah, it seems outlandish to me that we would ask sick Vermonters, uh, critically ill Vermonters, um, to pack up their bags every 28 days to step out of a motel for one day and move back in. A motel which is costing a fraction of what a hospital stay would cost and saving the, the state um, thousands, hundreds and thousands of dollars possibly. So I would support this uh, totally. Um, I, I, you know, for those reasons, I think it's just doesn't make any sense. I've had friends that lived in foreign countries that every three months you have to step over the border uh, to reapply for your uh, to for your visa, and that seems to be the same kind of thing. Only we're dealing with um, people that are critically ill. Um, you know that disruption has no place for um, our homeless uh, ill Vermonters. Representative Howard. I totally support this bill. Um, it has been um, an amazing effort by a number of agencies in Rutland. Um, Kevin Loso has done an amazing job. And um, uh, thank you, Claudio, for appearing today. Um, so I, I, I highly suggest that we go forward and pass this bill. Representative Kalaki. Well, I, I, I think the sentiment is there, so I think I would add, I would move to concur with the Senate and with that one proposal of amendment of just changing the date to upon passage. All right. Do we have a second right now? And I'm going to pause after I'll that. Second. I'll second. So, um, so Representative Howard, do you have a a just are you, are we prepared to to do a vote? Are you prepared to do a vote? Uh, bear with me. I have a brand new iPad that I'm learning to navigate here. Um, if, yeah, the dog ate your iPad. You know, I think the dog took the iPad and hit it. And I know it is in the, my house because IT um, told me that it was. Uh, we just couldn't make it um, sound off so I could actually locate it. So, but anyway. Um, have you looked in the, have you looked in the gopher hole in the backyard? 
No, it's in the house. Okay. <laughs> it's not outside. Um, I would need to have Ron send me the um, um, the uh, sheet for me to call. Yeah. So I'm just curious. Do we need? Can do we want to just come back to this in in an hour? and have the vote and, and let the back and forth go on. Is that, is, are you comfortable with that, Mary, rather than trying to get sure. it all done in the next two minutes? Sure. So Katie, um, you have a version of the bill. I mean, I, I, I think I asked Katie to just change the date to upon passage, which is what happened on the floor um, this week. So that would be, um, I mean, this would have to go back to the Senate after we do this on the floor, but again, it's just, uh, for them, it would just be concurring with the date change. Um, so Katie, is that ready to go? Um, so. Sure, I can have you take a look. It's with the editors right now, but I can show you the unedited version. Um, that's, so yeah, that's fine. And then, then if you wanna come back at 10, 15, if you need to be here, I don't know if you need to be here for, for that, but I think given Ron, given the process, it's been a while since we passed the bill. So, um, Ron, basically you would forward the final version to the clerk and then Mary would send an email to confirm what the vote was and we'd be all set. Is that right? Right. I send representative Howard, a, um, a copy of the record of action that I've completed based on the vote, which she confirms and then I send both her confirmation and the record of action to the clerk. Okay. So and, let's but we'll need the amended we'll need the amended version of the bill. Or at least I need the draft number in order to put that into the record of action. Okay. So Katie, can you show that to us? Sure. And then Mary and Ron, if you can just write down whatever the draft number is that shows up here. Is that lawnmower audible to everybody outside my window? So again, this is the unedited version. I'm not sure if their um, editors will change the lead in language, but it basically says that this committee was referred um, Senate Bill 137 um, reports that it's considered it and recommends that the House concurs with further amendment in Section 2 by striking out July 1, 2020 and inserting in lieu thereof passage. So section two would read, this act shall take effect on passage. Isn't it 187? Um, yes, it is. Thank you. Ron, taking over the proofreading. I know, thank you very much. So Mary, just for your pre preparations, it's draft 1.1 of S 187. I'll, I'll send Representative Howard a, a form with all that information on it. All right, and so we, we do have, and just the, um, and and just to keep it open, um, so Representative Kalaki made the motion and, and Representative Trinum seconded it. So you're halfway there with homework. All right, well, thank you committee. Um, and thank you, uh, we will return to this at, um, after 1015, after we hear more on 237, I've asked Representative Gonzalez to report this bill. Um, so um, I don't know if you need anything from Katie, but please feel free to reach out. Um, look at the underlying statute just to see the list of existing exemptions. And um, I think this will be a rather short uh, floor presentation, I would hope. Um, so thank you, everybody. This was, um, I'm, gl I'm glad it seemed as simple to you as it did, as it did um, to me and to the advocates earlier this year. So thank you. Um, Jason, if you want to return, feel free, but feel no pressure to, um, feel no pressure to uh, stick around for the next conversation unless you'd like to. Um, same thing with you, Claudio and Chris. Um, Thank you. I'm sure Chris will give me the the happy news at 10:15. Okay. Great. Well, thank Thanks you for so your much. testimony. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudio. Um, and again, thank you, committee. This is, it, 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 I mean, especially the way that Representative Triano put it, it seemed like it doesn't, it, it, it only made sense um, to fix that. So um, let's take a breath and move back to S237. Ron, are you supposed to contact the, um, any of the witnesses? Uh, no, I, I told them uh, that the first part would take uh, 45 to 60 minutes, which is almost exactly what we did. So um, they should be on their way. They've both submitted documents, so I know they know. Okay. And um, I'm going to take a look at but I'll documents. Let them that... know already. Well, Jacob is here. Right. Um, so, it, Jacob, if you could join us, and we'll get to the commissioner um, after your testimony. So, Jacob joined us last week, and uh, um, but didn't really have an opportunity to testify full out. And I wanted to give Jacob. So we have heard a lot of testimony from um, from folks who on this bill. Um, some of whom oppose certain sections of it and some of whom support sections of it. And I wanted to come back to Jacob because Jacob is, you know, this is his work in the, um, in, at DHCD. This is, you know, Jacob is kind of in charge of interpreting much of the law that we're talking about and certainly in what we're, what we're discussing about changing. And so I wanted to get his take, not just on um, just on the perceptions that uh, they've been working with in terms of moving this bill forward, but also to offer us, you know, d d there have been statements made about um, in testimony about what effect this bill might have on local planning and zoning. And I just wanted to, you know, offer Jacob a test, uh, an opportunity to clarify some of the testimony that he heard. Uh, and, um, you know, let us keep working on sifting through what the effects of this bill might have on, um, on all the different facets that we've heard about. Um, so Jacob, if you could, you know, just start by, um, you know, just start with the bio, maybe just give us your, your vitae for a little bit and then just, um, and then, and then open up the testimony and, you know, will people can pull up your, the documents that you've provided and, um, and we'll go from there. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Chair Stevens. And I don't know if uh, at, at any point um, it'd be helpful to uh, share the screen, but. Um, I, yes, Ron, if you could share the screen and then Jacob can, um, if Jacob can pull it up, that would be great. Great. So thank you, Representative Stevens, and, and thanks for the opportunity to present on S-237. So for the record, my name is Jacob Emmerich. I'm here today as a planning policy manager in the Department of Housing and Community Development. I moved to Vermont in 2012 in St. Albans and have since lived in Colchester and Barry City. I worked for the town of Milton as a planning and economic development director and have served on my local planning commission and now serve on city council in Barrie. I'm a proud member of the Vermont America, uh, the Vermont Planning Association, as well as the American Planning Association and a member of the Institute of Certified uh, Planners. And I'd like to begin by just saying how much I respect and value the testimony from the peers and colleagues. Um, one of the things we're called upon to do as, as a profession is to seek social justice in our code of ethics, um, is to seek social justice by working to expand choice and opportunity for all persons, recognizing a special responsibility to plan for the needs of the disadvantaged and to promote racial and economic integration. Our code goes on to say that we shall urge the alteration of policies, institutions, and decisions that oppose such needs. Um, and so you heard um, from, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying, pausing to see how to go to the next slide. Oh, and, and Jacob, you can, do you want to, are you comfortable sharing screen? Yeah, absolutely. I can share my screen. Is that okay. the better yeah, way to do it? Yeah. Ron, Ron, has made, Ron has made you a co-host. Great. There you go. Okay. 
So perfect. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. So you heard from Commissioner Hanford that the administration supports voluntary zoning reforms because we know for many decades, planning, studies, reports, project funding, and program administration, the re local reforms are really needed to make more naturally affordable housing. And we've seen that um, in the neighborhood development area designation program we administer that requires certain uh, local zoning provisions to become eligible, as well as our more recent project that you've heard uh, other people testify about, our zoning for great, great neighborhoods. Um, and I think the important thing to keep in mind, um, of course, is that zoning essentially says um, what can happen where. The planning and development community uh, kind of affirm this recognition that uh, we do need local zoning reform. In a, in, in a survey we uh, conducted as part of the Zoning for Great Neighborhood effort, uh, where the stakeholders listed municipal regulation as one of the top four reasons why it is difficult to build housing in walkable places. And that the, the top three are all impacted by zoning as well, the lack or high cost of available real estate. You heard Kathy Byers talk about that yesterday from Evernorth. High construction costs um, and people resisting change in their neighborhood. To really understand some of the challenges, even for the smallest uh, scale incremental home, a good case study to check out if you do have time is uh, the ADU, ADU, the Accessory Dwelling Unit Checklist the department put together and recently did. It walks policymakers through some of the steps a typical homeowner would take to build a very small home. And, and you've heard very thoughtful, and I think well-considered concerns from the planning community about the disruptions, uh, the reform elements of this bill would have on local regulations, the environment and community character. These are important to take into account and to balance with the economics of housing and the needs of people in, in, in Vermont. And as this committee is really well aware, housing supply is mismatched with demand. Our stock is very old. Our individual households are going down. Um, the total number of households are going up. The population is aging. And at the same time, we have two key age cohorts, boomers and millennials that are increasingly competing for the same units, convenient, walkable, small, affordable, easy to maintain. And, uh, and more new housing is being developed outside of our centers than inside. And that's increasing fragmentation of working lands. Um, and, and again, even more so now, affordability and supply is reportedly strained by uh, migration and demand. Uh, we all know that zoning can make homes less affordable and exclude. And in a way, this bill is kind of an acknowledgement that as Zuzana Davis pointed out in her testimony, zoning, land use, and housing policy have been used for several hundred years in the United States to physically and socially segregate people. And it has worked exactly as intended and created predictable patterns. She goes on to say an obvious approach to this inquiry should be reduced to should be to reduce our pattern matching. That is, if we want different results, we need to perform actions that are different from what we've been doing for so long. I think balancing the needs of our friends, families, and neighbors and future neighbors with the needs of the environment and community aesthetic values are really important. And, and careful deliberations um, by this committee, I'm hopeful, um, can make this bill even better and, and, and thread the needle appropriately. This bill prompts some hard decisions about the best level of government at, to ensure people have opportunities to live, work, and be able to stay and thrive in Vermont. And it would add preemptions um, uh, to pass legislation uh, addressing municipal exclusion of mobile home parks, recovery housing, multifamily accessory dwellings, and more. Um, and certainly not something to take lightly. And I'd like to be able to talk a bit about the specific provisions of the bill since some of the concerns the committee has heard, I think may be based on some misunderstandings about the authority of municipalities to regulate in direct ways uh, that are less likely to restrict opportunity and choice. For instance, a really direct way to protect historic character is to apply historic design review and a direct way to ensure development doesn't occur along water and sewer lines in places where a municipality doesn't wanna see development is to restrict connections to those water and sewer lines. Uh, and I know a key concern uh, about this legislation has been on mapping water and sewer in the municipal plan. Um, this is, uh, we think this is important in that it, uh, coordinating water and sewer investments with land use planning and regulation really drives affordability for energy, public services, 
housing and more. And that's because when water and sewer goes in, uh, development pressure typically follows. Uh, they, water and sewer enable smaller lots, less land than is needed for a well and on-site septic. And zoning that mandates low densities in areas served by water and sewer typically results in auto-oriented sprawl versus more compact forms of development, such as smaller lots uh, um, and uh, narrower streets. Water supply and sewage disposal mapping is already in statute, um, but it does, it is in with statute with less specificity um, than proposed. And many municipalities are al already doing this. And so it came as a surprise to me to learn about um, some of the bioterrorism concerns that uh, municipalities have. For instance, here's a future uh, a municipal plan, future facilities map for Berlin. It shows existing water, existing sewer, planned water, planned sewer, sewers areas, water source protection areas, pump stations, um, where the plant is. And that's a, that's a, a co, um, I'm not gonna get the term right, but it's a shared system with, uh, with Montpelier. Generally as a planning pr practice, mapping improves permit predictability, public asset management, and public transparency. And, and, we're, we're, and in terms of where does this bill or which municipalities does this bill affect? Um, we have reliable statewide data on municipalities that plan, municipalities that regulate land use, municipalities operating a sewer system, and the general service areas of those sewer systems. We have data gaps on municipalities that operate a water systems that are fire districts, um, consistently map uh, water service areas, water system constraints and sewer system constraints, which can be very nuanced um, as a public works director will point out where you know one trunk line might be able to um, take on a brewery and another trunk line may, might not be. The statewide mapping status of uh, wastewater systems is in progress by an ANR and we know 94 municipalities operate uh, wastewater systems um, and 83 of those regulate land use. These maps are available on the Vermont Planning Atlas, where you can hone in on individual communities like Plainfield, Vermont, where you can see their town boundaries, their approximate service area for their wastewater system, and, and exactly where their sewer lines are located. Um, I think there's been uh, just a great drive to make more information like this uh, transparent and available to the public. And just this year, um, we have now a fiber broadband map that's available to the public for the very first time, and we've included on, on the planning atlas. Um, municipalities can also uh, regulate uh, uh, their systems um, by ordinance and define service areas and, and, have, um, and, ha and have pretty sophisticated tools uh, in terms of allocations, uh, reserve capacity distribution, point systems. I'm not, I'm not an expert in that field, um, but, uh, but there are lots of tools a municipality can exercise in their water and sewer ordinances um, that have a big impact on, on land use. And here's another example from a municipal plan that shows that the water lines in Milton, Milton Vermont. Um, so, uh, Shifting a little bit to section, I, I, I know you had a, heard a recommendation uh, to, that the bill only apply to known lines, and I'd recommend that the bill retain present and prospective lines as a best practice, um, unless unless there's more information about bioterrorism concerns that um, that uh, that would otherwise restrict it. So shifting to section two, when we think about the economics of the housing market, we're really asking how supply and demand impacts prices and quantities with a focus on permit infrastructure uh, served, uh, permits for in infrastructure served areas to expand housing availability and getting to those conveyable units of real estate, whether it's a lot with a building, a condo in a building or a co-op share, begins um, for a builder and often in a local zoning office. Someone essentially rolls out their plans like, uh, like cookie dough. I'm gonna build on off the cookie cutter metaphor here. And the local zoning acts as a cookie cutter to determine what can get built. Um, statute and zoning both act to establish boundaries and edges. And the core question is what tool at what level gets Vermont to the cookies or homes we so badly need. In other words, how do our policies um, wall people off or invite people um, to build the homes we need? This section is narrowly focused 
on housing cost drivers like land cost, unit density, discretionary reviews and parking. And the committee has heard really a lot about density, which in zoning is a super complex term because it can refer to many things. You can talk about lot density, you can talk about building density, unit density and people density. But I, th I think most people have been referring it to it in testimony and in the committee as unit ditch density, which I, which I think is really important, um, but an even more basic building block of a community are streets and lots. Only from there can you begin to talk about, um, talk about building density, unit density, and other density. And, and I think being more per permissive about unit density is helpful. Uh, Kathy Byers talked about and, and Sue Philan about how that helped enable uh, a great project in Brattleboro. I know St. Albans has building, been build, building many um, uh, housing units in their downtown. Um, and, and I think that unit density really helps well finance and sophisticated develop, developers and are places like those um, where you can get the count you need to build a larger building on a large uh, on a lot that that gives you that that unit count, um, permissive densities can also help people unitize historic homes. Something uh, you you've heard some many communities are concerned about. Um, but what that unit density doesn't get at again is the most common form of development using the most uh, uh, using the most basic building block of zoning bylaw the lot size. And focusing on density over lots means that a bylaw is less likely to result in an affordable single family home. The more land you require for each lot, um, the more expensive it is. And, and I know many people dream in Vermont of owning a single family home. And, and for many people in Northwest and Chittenden County, it's, it's really out of reach um, for a lot of, a lot of a lot of people, and a lot of people don't have an interest in building a duplex or a four-unit building, or um, and being a, being a landlord. But single-family homes we know are the most common form of owned housing in Vermont, uh, not condos or co-ops or common interest um, common interest properties. So I just wanted to give that grounding in density, um, and and hopefully that um, helps frame frame the different types that we're talking about. So the first um, provision that's a bit uh, controversial in section two is to allow multifamily housing without a, without a character test. And I know there's been some uh, testimony about this triggering density. I think VPA has a good solution in their proposed edits um, because really what, what this was intended to get at was um, eliminating the character tests. Um, and this provision would apply to all municipalities that plan and regulate in zoning districts that allow multi family housing for small multifamily housing projects like this one photo uh, uh, pictured here in Winooski. So that would affect about 202 potential municipalities. Uh, and just to, I'm not sure if, if you've gotten any other testimony on a character test, but it's essentially a, a test that's used for um, in regulated zoning districts where use has been defined like multifamily has been defined as conditional. And conditional uses then get subject to five discretionary reviews, including character of the area. And that then becomes subject to a board review. It's not, it's not something that can be reviewed by the permitted administrator. And that board review, in the way that um, criteria is framed, generally makes that review less predictable and opens a wider door for appeals. Um, when that happens, it can increase the cost of housing and make it harder to build. So limiting this as a review standard does not affect a municipality's ability to apply site plan review, design review, historic preservation, form-based code, um, or other standards to ensure that what gets built is in character. Uh, it's more about uh, does the bylaw use clear and predictable standards um, so that somebody who wants to build multifamily housing um, can, can have a, a, a clear path um, uh, to a permit. Are there any questions at, at this point? No, okay. So the second provision is the exp extending accessory unit flexibility. And it seems like there's more consensus around uh, this provision. This applies in all municipalities that plan and regulate on owner occupied lots that aren't in a flood hazard area with a single family dwelling. And the whole point is to allow larger ADUs with um, owner occupants um, and empower the municipalities to regulate those ADUs distinctly from short-term rentals. Uh, the next provision is to allow development on existing small lots. So this would apply again in municipalities that plan and regulate with existing non-conforming small lots 
Um, so they're generally those lot size that have setbacks or a minimum lot size that aren't in compliance with what's in the regulations that are served by water and sewer. And there are 83 municipalities potentially affected by this provision. And I have an example here of a building in Bellis Falls, a beautiful downtown building that um, would typically be illegal to develop under many Vermont bylaws. And that's because many of our, our bylaws were adopted in the 60s and 70s and reflect um, auto-oriented suburban values and, and, and make our historic pattern of development uh, illegal. So the work that like Mike Miller talked about doing in, in Montpelier is really important where you try to match the conformity, try to bring your code up so that most of your buildings um, conform, uh, uh, or your, most of the, your code uh, provisions conform with the buildings and lots as they exist. But, but in, in a way, we, we, if we're, if we're going to go farther, we need to go beyond just matching the pattern. Um, and before talking, and Jacob, yeah. I'm sorry. Can I? Uh, and I don't know if this this coincides with this, but the so we heard from the Lamoille um, Regional mm -hmm. Planning Commission, and they were talking about um, the problem, uh, not the problems, but some of the difficulties in developing like this in their downtowns because of the they're they're in the flood zone and mm -hmm. and they do actively flood. Um, how? Their language that they proposed would say, well, we can't do that because there's certain land issues here. I mean, there's just, I can't do that because the river is going to flood here. So what, can you, is this, does this play into any of the um, overlapping zones that like an effluvial zone or, or flood zone where people are absolutely banned from, from further development? Yeah, well, we, I can say we absolutely don't want to encourage um, the uh, development in, in flood zones that would otherwise um, be, re be restricted. And as I look over the uh, provision, um, it's looking like that that could be a, that the LCPC has flagged a, a, a gap that this committee might want to, it should address. So. Okay, thank you. And Representative Walls had a question. Uh, thank you. I'm really glad to hear from you, Jake. And I've got a, one of my big issues with this bill is I've been trying to picture what the heck it would do in Barry City, and you would know. <laughs> so I'm going to ask a, a, a specific question. For those of you, Jake and I both live on Camp Street in Barry City, uh, where the housing lot size is typically a third of an acre or bigger, quite a few bigger. And I just don't understand the potential impact on a street like Camp Street, and I'm sure many other communities have a street like ours. Yeah, that's you know that's how, honestly. I just don't understand how it would work. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a perfect question. I think it feeds into uh, uh, the the next slide, um, which is a scenario based slide, and so. Um, we're in different zoning districts in Barry City, and uh, um, I think you have a higher minimum lot size than than mine is. It would uh, uh, allow smaller lots in your zoning district. And um, here's an example of a, a small scale lot subdivision scenario. So let's say you have a couple that are retiring and they want a smaller lower maintenance home that frees them up to take more vacations. Um, but they can find very few small homes in their community, which is uh, pretty typical in Vermont. And they've looked at the senior apartments in town, but they don't feel quite ready for that. They live on a third acre village lot, or it could be a city lot, zoned for residential uses and served by water and sewer with capacity. And they really value kind of the convenience of living in the village. They like being able to walk to the store and library. Um, so they go to the zoning administrator and they learn that the zoning doesn't allow them to subdivide, but it does allow them to build a one bedroom ADU, which is kind of the current uh, 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 threshold and statute that's commonly uh, put in local bylaws. So, but the, the thing is they, they do kind of want two bedrooms so two people can visit and they're really not keen to be landlords, which is what we hear quite a bit around the state. And also their existing home would need code improvements to meet the rental housing safety code, um, which they could sell without doing any of those improvements. So really what they would prefer to do is be able to subdivide and use their extra land to build a small home that meets their need. And so with a water wastewater permit, local lot size reform like proposed in this bill would allow this couple to subdivide, build a new home and sell their old home without leaving their neighborhood and community. So essentially what it would do is allow more infill development um, for the residential uses that are permitted in that zoning, in that zoning district. Is that helpful, Representative Waltz? Yes, it, it helps. And I have a second question. 
And again, uh, you're familiar with what we got in Barry. We have a couple of tiny homes. And I'm just wondering how what we're getting is an image of we're taking a, maybe an existing structure and turning it into four units, or we're building something like you showed us in Bellows Falls. But I'm just wondering the concept of tiny homes like we have in Brook Street in Barry. How does that fit into S two thirty seven? Um, I, I think it would enable it would enable more uh, tiny homes if people want to build them. I think one thing that's uh, unusual about tiny homes is that they've they've fallen into this odd category because they're often on wheels, um, and so they can um, they can fit in different boxes and different zoning codes. But a small home on a foundation. Um, uh, whether it's uh, whether it's tiny or moderately small would be treated equally under under the these 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 reforms. So we're not necessarily talking about one building containing four or eight units. No, the the local bylaw would still establish um, the allowable uses, and this bill would allow a, a duplex um, uh, on a lot. Okay, thank you. All right, another uh, representative Gonzalez. And just in a, in a follow up to, um, to that line of questioning from representative Waltz of, of that um, as your scenario uh, slide laid out and as my understanding of this is that there is no requirement to subdivide or no requirement to, mm -hmm. um, to, to mm -hmm. have extra infill. It is uh, the scenario that you provided is uh, what, what I keep thinking about in terms of people who own a lot, that would like to be um, at the point of selling it, would like the possibility of subdividing it. And that, um, as you've laid it out, is what this bill would allow, but it's not forcing anything. That's correct. And, and I think uh, our observations of the um, housing market in Vermont is that very few places have an, an explosive market. Most, most development is very incremental. Um, enabling does not uh, equal actual construction. You heard that from uh, Sue Fillion, um, but it doesn't eliminate the possibility. And I think that's the um, that's what this is getting at. Okay, and I'm just gonna, um, Jacob, it's 9.51. Mm -hmm. I just wanna um, acknowledge that the commissioner is that uh, Commissioner Walk is here too, and we, we need to get to him and then back to that other bill. So um, I don't know where you are with stuff. This, this is a very, th incredibly thorough um, slide deck. Thank you for providing it. Um, hold on, is it Representative Hango, do you have a question right here before we let Jacob um, head to the quarter poll? Yes, I do, thank you. Just a quick question and um, it may not be a quick answer and you can tell me that you don't know what it looks like, but um, thinking of a town in my district that has um, water and it has no services other than a quick stop slash gas station. So if this, if this stretch of highway in this town were to have this type of dense development, what do you see that looking like? What, what purpose would this serve to, to this community? Um, well, I think when we look at uh, places in rural Vermont and, and maybe like Highgate or is maybe a scenario like that, um, many of them, uh, and it's not true everywhere, um, are uh, struggling to maintain population, um, to sustain their tax base, uh, to keep students in classrooms. Um, and, uh, and you saw from uh, Mark Collins that many communities are seeing a decline in housing supply. And so, and with, a, and with an increasing number of households and a decreasing number of uh, uh, people in those households, uh, if you're not building more housing units, um, I think small villages like that could be really putting themselves at a disadvantage uh, by not um, welcoming new residents. Um, and, and, and I think that's the link here is that it's about long-term prosperity and these reforms have been uh, very difficult for uh, communities to achieve. Well, thank you for that answer. I absolutely cannot see what value a, 
a planned community would have unless they had services such as stores and some type mm -hmm. of transportation. Um, I, I can't see this stretch of road um, benefiting from this at all just because it has a water system and somebody wants to sell lots. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It, 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 would not that town need to have more of a zoning plan in place under these circumstances? I mean, in order to in order to to plot this out, there has to be a master plan. There has to be a municipal plan. Does there not? That's correct. They do have to plan and regulate to to become applicable. Right. And if they did, this would supersede whatever that town has already planned was my understanding that someone who was interested in developing could develop under this statewide law. Uh, they would still have to go and get wastewater per, they'd have to get the permits that exist now that they would have to do now. Um, the municipal plan would have to be written in coordination with state law. Um, anyway, it's there's, a, I don't know that anyone I mean, Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't view this as somebody looking at an open slot in an unzoned area and easily being able to develop that without local input and without the, the correct permits in place to talk about capacity, to talk about, like, just because, just because I have, we have a sewer system doesn't mean that I can build, like Stowe said, 51,000 units. I have to have the capacity to do that and capacity is not only processing capacity, but it could mean, you know, I mean, 51,000 units in Stowe might be, might turn Route 100 into a spur of I-89. Um, it, it, you know, that's a capacity issue. Um, so I'm just, I just want to make sure we're drawing the right lines here in terms of the, the, the interplay between what Representative Hango is concerned about, which is that this state law would supersede local you know, the, the local stuff in ways that would be truly detrimental. Well, we don't have sewer system, so it it's up to whatever the soils can support for septic systems. Right, so, which is a capacity, uh, which is a capacity issue. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. All right. Representative Kalaki, and then I want to, again, I want to um, let, let Jacob, and Jacob, I think I have you scheduled for next week as well. Um, at least for one day. So, um, John? Uh, Jacob, uh, your testimony was very helpful to me and it's very thoughtful. And it looked like you were actually reading from some pre prepared remarks. So I would benefit if that's true, if you could send those along as well, so I can spend a little more time with your thought process. I can do that. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, Jacob, wrap it up <laughs> or, or where do you want, I mean, what, what is it that, um, what's the last word you want to leave us with right now? Cause I mean, we still have a lot of homework to do on this bill and especially on these sections here. Um, I mean, what's the best way for us to look at, again, some you, you said that some of the recommendations that have been presented are well worth our consideration. Um, as we go ahead into the weekend, what is it that what is it that we should be looking at in terms of um, our work next week? In terms of some of these issues that have been brought up. Yeah, well, I I, th I think we could I could loop back on on Tuesday with a more uh, better informed or better better framed response to that that question. But um, but I think v VPA has offered some uh, very well considered proposals. Uh, DHCD would be a little bit concerned about um, linking any of these provisions to the designated centers. And part of the reason for that is that these are very constrained um, uh, geographies because they're mostly designed for, or initially were put together to support uh, tax credit projects um, to fix up historic buildings. Um, though some like the growth center and neighborhood development area are, are better prepared and aligned um, to, uh, with, with elements of, of this bill. Um, the bill focuses on sewer and water service areas with capacity um, for lots and buildings that can make connections. And, uh, and I, th I think that's a better, um, a, 
a, a better focus than um, tying them to designated centers. Um, and that's because municipalities have the authority um, to, to regulate, um, regulate those areas for um, and link it with their land use. And, and the substantial, is it the substantial needs report? Is it the substantial, what do we, what is it called in the constraint, Yeah, the substantial constraint report. They, they uh, have a long list of um, uh, things that could be taken into account, which I, I think the bill does address by saying other public services. They mentioned stormwater schools, transportation. Um, I, I, I don't think uh, th that it would be wise uh, if the legislation um, didn't uh, take those constraints into account because there can be very legitimate reasons why uh, a develop is not appropriate in a particular uh, uh, a particular place. So, so w one of the concerns that I heard from some of the planners was the the notion that this substantial constraints report was not fully developed, or that is it, it, it is that that's something that would be developed over time at DHCD? Is that is that what the original thought thinking was on that? Yeah, I think uh, the, the, the bill language would uh, require that DHCD uh, provide a, a, a template and guidance on the form by January 1st, 2021. Okay, okay. And I view that as one of the ways of, of people having a safety valve if they feel like they can't do it. I mean, I know there's other, there's other pieces that go along with that, but um, Representative Zott. Yeah, just a quick uh, clarifying question. When you said that you didn't want it tied to designated centers, uh, I'm a little confused. I don't recognize that term. You don't, are you saying that, because part of the testimony we heard was maybe tying it to neighborhood development areas. Are you saying that that is or is not a good idea? DHCD would uh, would prefer that they not be tied to the state designated centers because not all state designated centers um, are, are aligned with water and sewer service areas, um, and the geographies are generally very very small areas. Um, for instance, it's the um, uh, historic um, uh, center, uh, commercial core of a of a, of a town. Or of a downtown, and uh, and there, though usually the sewer and water service areas serve a much, much uh, broader area, um, and so um, we'd like to see uh, the impact would be greater um, if the bill was linked with water and sewer service areas instead of designated areas. Um, but I, I acknowledge that that would be an incremental step um, uh, towards expanding housing opportunity. I. I think I'm hung up on the uh, you're using designated areas. Is that a, a, an official nomenclature collectively for the village center downtown designation and neighborhood development areas, or is it just you're just using it loosely? No, that's 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 an official nomenclature for yeah designated downtowns, designated village centers, new town centers, growth centers, and uh, neighborhood development areas. Okay, thank okay. you. Helpful. All right. Thank you very much, Jacob. I think it's um, I think it's um, there. There are times where I feel like the information, especially the, the slide that you is like a sponge before we add water to it. I think that there's much more information in there. Um, and I think for the committee, I think if we can look at Jacob's um, in in coordination with the other information that we've received, I think it will be very helpful homework to do. Um, feel free to stick around um, for the commissioner's testimony. Commissioner Walk, thank you so much for waiting. Um, welcome to our committee. I'd introduce ourselves if, the, if we were in 3D, but you can see all of our names uh, on the screen, I presume. And um, I just, if you could, uh, um, my understanding was that you wanted to testify originally on the um, privacy issues regarding the water systems. Is that right? Or is that, was that, um, that might be uh, Jeff Wenberg from Rutland on, on, Mon on Tuesday, but at any rate, welcome to the committee. Um, and uh, if you want to just introduce yourself, tell us where, where, uh, where you sit, what your interests are, and what, you're, what you'd like to testify on in this bill. Sure. Thank you. Uh, for the record, I'm Peter Walk. I'm the uh, commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation. 
Um, I, I, broadly speaking, we are supportive of this bill. It's, it's doing a number of things that we are appreciative of and in support of, of, of making housing more affordable in Vermont. Um, there are a couple of issues that we see that, uh, that should, should be fixed if there's an opportunity to. Um, and I would just love the opportunity to go through those with you. They're relatively uh, small in the grand scheme of things, but they're impactful for the, the individual communities that, that are represented. And um, I just want to have the opportunity to discuss them with you. Um, and then the, as for the privacy matter, that must be Jeff. I'm not aware of what, uh, of, of those concerns and I'm not planning to testify to those today. Um, if it's, if it's possible for me to share my screen, I can walk you through sort of some very explicit changes that we would recommend and I can explain the why of those changes relative to the bill. Um, I know you're, you're sort of just getting your arms around this bill that so maybe this might be a little bit premature but I didn't given the time frame uh, that you guys are all operating under in this confined session I wanted to make sure that we had those uh, things heard in part because um, some of the proposed language that came out of the Senate uh, unfortunately gives the false sense of hope that the department might be able to do something to support a local community that it cannot uh, because of federal requirements. And I just want to make sure that we're, we're all on the same sheet of music. Um, all right. So you have been made a co-host, so you should be able to share the screen. Me make sure it's as big as it possibly can be. Uh, let's see. Um, let me know when you can see my screen. It should be a, a, a document talking about a couple sections of the bill. All right. So um, one of the, the proposals in this bill is to make uh, a qualified flood mitigation project eligible for uh, downtown tax credits and sort preservation tax credits. We are very supportive of that work. We think it's a great plan. Um, as we talk about kind of creating uh, dense housing opportunities, uh, one of the challenges that we face, and this is a climate change, both a mitigation and an adaptation, from mitigation and adaptation standpoint, is the fact that many of our existing built environments, which we'd like to take advantage of uh, and, and create public transit and other opportunities around, are in floodplains and uh, could be subject to, uh, to flood risk and other things as we're, as we're moving forward. So we need to make sure that we have the opportunity to help uh, our communities weather these storms and be better prepared moving forward. So we're generally supportive. Uh, this one is a relatively small change uh, we worked on the uh, initial language with uh, ACCD, so there, you know, so, so we're in lockstep here. The the uh, a the language highlighted in in yellow, um, where it says with an area subject to the river corridor rule, was added at some point in, in the Senate, and it just doesn't. Um, they're not the same thing. When we're talking about flood risk, we really are talking about the flood hazard area. That's the purpose of that mapping exercise is to see where flood inundation could occur. Um, the, the river corridor rule is really about where there is the potential for high erosion activity. And so they're, they're related and, and many times they overlap, but they are separate in nature. Um, and so you could have a river core, you know, something that's mapped on the river as part of the river quarter rule uh, that was a small stream running through, you know, running through wooded area rather than the sort of traditional floodplains that we're thinking about, about our, around our built environments where these things might be built. Um, and, it, and while it's a relatively small piece, we think it's, it's worth striking that. So you're focused on what's really the, the flood risk um, the other piece is that it, it's technically not called the river corridor rule. And so it, it seems a sort of an odd and out of, slightly out of place reference. So our, our preference would be for you to strike that language. Um, I won't take, happy to take questions on it, but it's, it's a relatively straightforward piece that I think 
um, was put in there probably with the best intention to make sure as many projects were eligible as possible. But if we're really focused on addressing flood hazards, then this is the, then the existing language or the, the previous language, which didn't include this piece would be uh, most appropriate. So is this, this is a new, this, all this language is new to this bill. It's not existing statute. It, correct. Okay. Okay. So that's section 13. Yep. Yes. Uh, and then moving down and this one is, is more complicated and it, you know, it, it causes me some heartburn to have to bring it to you. Uh, but, um, this one is specifically related to situation in the town of Brattleboro where there is a mobile home park in, in a floodplain uh, that is subject to flooding and, and, and significant risk. Um, we have, there, there is a goal to get those, that community out of that floodplain that we share. Um, the challenge is that the language in here uh, essentially asks the department to make the state revolving funds, either the clean water state revolving fund or the drinking water state revolving fund available to help those communities relocate out of the floodplain. Uh, the challenge being that those are not eligible costs under federal requirements, that we couldn't use those resources to move uh, those communities we can restructure the existing loans that 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 though that the i believe that the town of rattleboro on behalf of the mobile home park has uh and we can make those longer term we now have the capacity to make those a 40-year term at a negative interest rate which helps uh that community save money in the in the long run um, but it is not possible for us to provide resource, the, these resources specifically to relocate the, the mobile home park. Um, and, and so I just- it, is, I'm sorry, is, so is that because of an interplay between, I mean, I mean was, this, was there an anticipation that, that, that FEMA funds would be used for something like this and FEMA funds are not, they may help mitigate flooding, but not, but not, uh, fund this kind of process as removal? Uh, FEMA funds regularly uh, make relocation possible. It is a, it is a frankly a long process um, where a community has to have a hazard mitigation uh, plan. And then, you know, they go through a hazard, hazard mitigation grant process where the, you know, has to you sort of have to look at various options that are available to prevent flood impacts. Um, and one of those outcomes could be uh, the buy, uh, buyout program, which you often hear the sort of FEMA buyout programs. Um, that is a path. I, I don't know the history of this particular park and to know whether they've attempted to go down this path. I just want to highlight that if we, if we pass a, a law that suggests to this community that, this, that these funds could be made available, that we're providing them with false hope. Okay, Representative Kalaki had a question. Uh, Peter, it, I, I, I understand what, what you're talking about in one, but why not in two just say, provide similar assistance to the extent possible mobile home parks that have the same infrastructure needs? Uh, we're happy to chain to, to only strike the 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 relocation part. I think we are providing um, we are providing uh, infrastructure support to those communities, and so in some ways it would be kind of redundant of of the work that we're doing now. I wouldn't be opposed to leaving it in there, uh, but it's it's really the relocation component thereof that is the challenge. I, 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 I understand your perspective. Thank you. Um, and then there's one more piece kind of down, down further below. Uh, the uh, Senate put this in here to sort of ask us to, to identify other opportunities to support these communities. Um, 
And there's a pretty uh, general language in your here that I think uh, if you're if you're going to pursue this path, we we would appreciate you better defining it for us, which is um, to improve access in terms of mobile home parks and other small communities. Um, most communities in Vermont are small, depending on your measure. And so in, in order to make sure that we're providing the advice uh, that you actually seek, it would be good to know uh, really what the focus of that um, piece is. Okay. Um, and you know, certainly we are, we, are, we understand that, that, that um, many of these mobile home park communities are in those, uh, those lands which are most inexpensive and they are often in floodplains and we would love to see them uh, be more resilient and be outside of those floodplains. So this is not a, this is not a, uh, a comment on the purpose or the intent here. It is simply a, the, whether or not the mechanism that's been suggested is appropriate. Um, and so I hope everybody, uh, I hope my testimony can reflect that. Um. We have two questions here, um, Representative Triano, then Hengo. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here today, Commissioner. Um, somewhere along the line, and I can't find my notes right now, um, there was discussion about this specific mobile home park and flood plain mitigation. Um, and I'm not sure what that looks like in particular, but um, it, it, the recollection I have was that it was something that was being looked at um, as far as um, keeping this home, uh, this park uh, where it is and not displacing, um, I guess, a fair uh, large uh, number of uh, uh, tenants uh, from it um, to relocate. And I was wondering if that's anything that you had any information on or, you know, what a what floodplain mitigation might look like. I mean, we talking about dikes, building dikes around it, or, you know, it's just um, a mystery to me at this point. So, Representative Trout, I will have to do some more research into the specifics of this. Um, generally speaking, if it's going to be a FEMA-funded project, it has to provide relief that doesn't impact others, and oftentimes a, you know, levy or a dike around uh, a, a community can have you know, impacts elsewhere and just push the water elsewhere. So we know the, wa the water always wins. Um, and so planning those projects have to, has to be, you know, very carefully done. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Okay, Representative Hango. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, my question is about larger municipalities and wastewater capacity and with all the changes that have been proposed to this bill, I've kind of lost sight of the original bill as written. So Burlington and St. Albans City have both had um, some big sewage spills into the lake in recent years. And I am not certain that this bill puts a cap on development in terms of wastewater capacity, and please correct me if I'm wrong in that. Uh, that specific component, Representative Hango, I will need to go back and look at. I am not sure it does either, but uh, you know, as as we've been uh, following ACCD's lead, I'll be happy to take a look and see if that's the case. The issues that we have with uh, with uh, combined sewer overflows, which are where those spills come from. Or is a long-standing issue that we have, you know, are working on changing over time. But it is a, it is a multi-billion-dollar project to 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 address those across the state. I mean, there, um, and it is, you know, only getting worse as our storm events are uh, are more impactful uh, on a you know on a regular basis. And and it is those high rain events that are really that really caused the, the CSOs. Um, and so we need to figure out, we need to be addressing those over time and how to retain more of that stormwater on the, in, you know, in the environment so that it is not ending up in our stormwater system. But yes, that is a long-term issue that we all, we all are aware of and we're, we're, you know, we, to the, to the public's dismay, we are not 
moving as quickly as, as, as they would like, but there is a certain amount of, of reality as sources associated with the resources needed to address them. So I would really appreciate, um, thank you, if you would uh, look into this, how this bill addresses that issue. This is a tremendously important issue um, for anybody who lives in a community that is in the Lake Champlain watershed. And I know that um, I'm horrified every time I hear of a CSO that happens, and it seems to, as you said, happen really frequently um, in recent years. So I think this bill as written, if it does not address that, I, I can't imagine supporting extra development in those communities that could potentially cause more of a problem if an event like this happens again, which I think we all know will happen with um, the changes in the climate that are that are occurring. So I would appreciate an answer to that, how this bill addresses that. Thank you. Happy to provide that answer. Thank you. All right, anything else for the commissioner at this time? Representative Byron. Um, good morning, Peter. How you doing? Good morning. Um, so I got two, I guess, two questions for you around the mobile um, home park component. Um, first, I mean, it speaks very specifically to Tri Park in the Brattleboro area. Um, my district has the Otter Creek mobile home park that uh, that also has the same sort of placement on a, 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 a I mean it's on the Otter Creek and I've spoken with the um, executive director at uh, Addison County uh, Housing Trust multiple times about the issues uh, with that that seem to parallel this tri-park issue um, so with this speaking specifically to that is this would this exclude access to a, however the language lands on this from an entity like that so it is is not our desire uh, to uh, exclude access to tools that might be available to anybody. It is simply saying that the tool that is being highlighted here as a potential silver bullet is is not actually able to be fired uh, <laughs> at the target. So so it's essentially we we're appreciative of the effort. You know, unfortunately, this is not the tool to use. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then I guess like my last question is around Tri Park. Uh, how was the money used post Irene to help out with that? Because I mean, that was long before I was involved in these conversations at this level of knowledge, depth and detail. But with the Irene funds, were they used, how it, it applied in a similar way to what is spoken to in this language or how is it different? Do you know? I'm just curious. I would highly encourage you to have the experts from Vermont Emergency Management, the folks who run our hazard, hazard mitigation grant program can talk about all of the work that was done under Irene. I would be skimming the surface at best. Um, and so, and, and they can really give you a sense of sort of, of what opportunities uh, were available after Irene. But as a reminder, it's, we've had many more declared emergencies since Irene where, you know, where low lying communities have been affected consistently. Okay, cool. Do you mind just shoot me like a, a good point person for contact there, or just an email or something? Sure, it's ben.rose at vermont.gov. All right, thanks. Thank you very much, Commissioner. No problem. All right, Representative Long. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming, Commissioner Walk. Um, I want to speak specifically to the Tri Park issue. And I think I heard you say that you weren't familiar with the specifics around this. And um, if that's so, I would encourage you to um, review what they have in place, which is a master plan, I believe, um, to help address the challenges that they've been facing. And um, I, it, it was my understanding that this language was put in there in the Senate and um, was supported, and and there were there weren't there wasn't pushback for this move. And um, it is 
I think you've heard other people mention it is a very, very specific and very critical issue for that community in Brattleboro. And so um, if you could take a look at their master plan and, and become a little more familiar with that, that would be really helpful for me. Representative Long, I will happily admit that I, you know, that I need to do that and will do that. Uh, and, and we're not suggesting that their master plan is, is not appropriate. What, what we testified into the, in the Senate and to you here uh, is the, the fact that, that the fund cannot be used for this purpose. And so that is, that is the challenge that we face. It is not the intent behind the plan, the goals of the plan. It is simply whether or not the money that is attempting to be identified to be used to implement the plan is accessible. All right, well, thank you, Commissioner. Um, this is helpful and I appreciate you taking the time to come in. Um, we are on a, as, you, as you're aware, we're all on a fairly accelerated schedule to, um, to try to take on this information and process it and try to make sure that there's a balance and I appreciate you coming in and, and um, clarifying some of the concerns that, that have been raised over over really an area i mean what stood out from sue fillion's testimony last week was how important this mobile home park is to the community um not just as a place where affordable housing exists but that it is six to eight percent of brattleboro's population and um it's pretty um so understanding what your changes are, we're going to, again, that's our homework for the weekend is to try to really um, understand where you're coming from and, and, and how we can process that as we work towards this bill. So thank you. Thank you for coming in. Um, I'm happy to be here. And again, I, 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 I apologize if I'm conveying in any way, shape or form that I don't want to help resolve the issue. I just, I, the, the language here suggests that it will provide resolution and I can't provide that to the community based on the, the, the rules. And so I'm happy to help think through what other tools we might be able to bring to bear, but I can't, I can't bring that specific tool to bear because of federal rules around how those funds can be used. Um, no, that's fair. And, and I appreciate that. Again, I think, you know, anybody who's trying to, I, I mean, when in the aftermath of Tropical Storm Irene, of course, we've heard, I, in Waterbury, we heard stories of towns in the Midwest that got moved um, away from a river and up to a mountain top. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is, this is the level that we're talking about when we're talking about relocation here. We know it's not simple. Um, we know that basic settlement patterns in Vermont, especially for mobile home parks, unfortunately fell along riversides because the land at one point was inexpensive and water washed a lot away. Um, and we, but we also know that replacing six to 8% of a town's population someplace safe where there's infrastructure is um, there's probably not enough money in at least Vermont's coffers to contemplate what that might mean. And that and Brattleboro is not the only community. So understanding the details, I understand that you're, you're coming across with a, with a, a knowledge of what the federal regulations are as they exist at this time. And so we'll, we'll move forward from there. Um, but we are on an accelerated schedule. So if there's something as you're driving along this weekend that you can help, you know, that you flash upon that you can help us with um, to really assure a community like Brattleboro, like this, this mobile home park that the state does support, um, that does, that the state does support their fear that, that, that their fears need to be alleviated in some way, um, or knowledge that the state has their back in case this happens again, um, or when this happens again, I think is really the unfortunate way of looking at it. Um, I would appreciate that. I think that would be a great opportunity to hear from uh, the um, about Vermont Emergency Management about what their programs look like because that I, I presume that those that relocation of a midwestern town 
uh, was likely uh, FEMA hazard mitigation grant money, which is, is, is there in place to help avoid issues in the future. And so though, you know, sort of, we, we see, we've seen this a lot where, you know, a community or a set of houses flood regularly. There's an opportunity to say, rather than having FEMA come in and assist them every time, let's see if we can find a way to, to move them out of danger to begin with. Um, and so that's typically the path that's been used. Yeah, and it, and it's not free money, um, and you know, we I, I won't we, we need to move back to the S one eighty seven right now, but um, we'll follow up with that I will. early next week. Thank you so much. Work on the pieces that that you've asked of me and, and get back to you. Yeah. All right. And before he goes, Lisa, do you have one more comment? Um, that's what I just wanted to comment on uh, getting back to us, especially on the, the wastewater, because I just see something that came to us from the Chittenden County um, Regional Planning Commission that um, talks about a prohibition on municipalities banning development on existing lots, one acre of an acre in size if they are able to connect to municipal sewer and water. So that really does concern me. So I would really appreciate an answer. Thank you. Of course. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. Have a good weekend. Take care. Thank you for coming in. Um, committee, it's 1029. We have um, Katie McLean has has uh, returned. And um, basically, we are at a place where we have had a motion to um, concur with the Senate with further amendment and we were voting on version 1.1 of S187. That was, the motion was made by Representative Kalaki and um, seconded by Representative Triano. Before we ask to start a vote on that, are there any further comments? Um, yes, I just wanted to know if there is a clean copy of this that we're reading. I, I do have a clean copy. Would you like me to put it up on the screen? That would be great if we could just briefly run through it. It's pretty quick. It's also posted on our website. Thank you. That's good enough for me. Katie, are you, a, so Lisa, are you okay? Or do you need to see it on the screen? I'm sorry. Okay. All right, seeing no further comments, um, the clerk may commence to call the roll. Representative Wells. Yes. Representative Gonzalez. Yes. Representative Long. Yes. Representative Gamash. Representative Troiano. Yes. Representative Howard votes yes. Representative Kalaki. Yes. Representative Zott. Sorry, Randall, we missed you. Do you want to throw your vote in the chat box? Still, Ducant didn't hear you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Representative Zott voted yes. Um, Representative Byron? Yes. Representative Hango? Yes. Representative Stevens? Yes. Representative Gamash? So the vote is 10-0-1. All right, thank you committee. Thank you for, for um, working so quickly on this. I appreciate it. I know it's appreciated by um, the folks that this will impact. And um, so, so Ron and do their magic with this and Representative Gonzalez will prepare a floor report um, and then we will send it in the system and see where it comes up. And I guess, um, Deanna, if you're 
I, I don't know what the schedule is going to be in terms of um, uh, a caucus of a whole that will help explain the bill before the vote, but um, I can't imagine that this would be controversial. So um, just be prepared for Tuesday. Will do. Thank you. All right, committee. Thank you. Good work today.